Welcome to Since He Reformed. I'm Pastor Brandon. I'm joined with my co-pastor, Pastor Zach, and uh, we're pastors at, at Westside Reformed Church. And it is a URCNA congregation in the west side of Cincinnati. And that's actually what we want to talk about is the URCNA. That's a denomination that many people probably have not heard about. Um, many people have heard the word maybe Reformed or Presbyterian, but uh, the URC or the URCNA um, is a denomination that uh, is, is relatively um, smaller and, uh, and because of that unknown. And so we want to talk about the kind of the history and identity of the URC. And so in this podcast episode, I thought I would interview Zach. Um, now, Zach has been part of a URC church for 11 years. He has interned at a URC church for three years. He's been a church planter for the URC for eight years, and he has served as clerk of the Eastern classes in the URC for six years. So he has a lot of uh, experience, knowledge, uh, and time spent in the URC. And so I thought it'd be a great opportunity to interview him, kind of pick his brain. Uh, where does the URC come from? Uh, what is it about? And as people are coming into kind of the URC or they're maybe Googling the URC, uh, they might hear the phrase Dutch Calvinist or Dutch Reformed. And um, they think, well, I'm not Dutch. <laughs> And I live in America. I don't live in the Netherlands. And so what's going on with this Dutch church or this Dutch movement in America? So, Zach, you want to talk to us a little bit about what is the, the connection with the Netherlands? Yeah, great question. Um, I guess first, maybe a couple of background things just to note. When we say URC or URCNA, what we're referring to is the United Reformed Churches in North America. So oftentimes we just make that URC for short, United Reformed Churches. Uh, we're a relatively young denomination. Some of our people prefer to use the word federation, but it's really, you know, six in one hand, half dozen in the other. And uh, we come from, as you mentioned, a Dutch background. When you think about the history of the United States of America, we're all you know, immigrants, so the vast majority of us at least. and our own um, theological, ecclesiastical tradition was brought over by Dutch immigrants who spoke Dutch, surprise, surprise. And they were connected then with the um, uh, churches in the Netherlands. And what happened was in the middle of the 19th century, 1850s around there, there was um, a secession movement from the state church in the Netherlands. And the state church was becoming uh, liberal, and they were abandoning many of the historic reformed um, beliefs. And so there was a secession movement, and that secession movement struggled to find a, a place to um, worship and to function within Dutch society. And so they immigrated to the United States, as many others during that time were doing. And many of them ended up in Michigan or in um, Iowa, and some ended up getting out to the West Coast also. And so those Dutch immigrants then ended up eventually forming what's called the uh, Christian Reformed Churches North America. And that is the denomination from which we emerged in the 19, uh, 1990s. So there's this Dutch heritage, you could say, and we very much respect our Dutch heritage, and there's still many congregations where if you went to one of those congregations, you would find a lot of people that are, you know, well above six foot tall with blonde hair and blue eyes, <laughs> and even some, uh, you even hear some uh, Dutch accents in, within the congregation. It's a really neat thing, and to have a real um, love for and embrace of that, um, that cultural heritage, but also that theological heritage, and I think it's a really beautiful thing. But um, that, the, but calling ourselves Dutch Reformed is more of a theological thing, though, to say that we come from that uh, theological, ecclesiastical lineage. I'm not Dutch. You're not Dutch. Um, many of us are not, uh, are not Dutch. But, uh, yeah, I think you could say that to maybe connect uh, our lineage with the Reformation, 
the the Dutch Reformed uh, were connected with, especially with Geneva and with uh, John Calvin. There was a lot of influence there as uh, John Calvin was teaching and writing in Geneva and influencing the the French Reformed. There was a, a large connection there between the French Reformed and then what later became called the Dutch Reformed. And um, the author of our conf of our Belgic Confession, Guy de Bray, was very dependent upon Calvin's works and Calvin's uh, confession when he uh, helped work on the when he penned the Belgic Confession. So there's a lot of c connections there. The Dutch Reformed were also very reliant upon the German Reformed with the Heidelberg Catechism, and so. When we think about our own Dutch Reformed background, we're thinking about what is oftentimes referred to as the Continental Reformed tradition, which would be in, in distinction from the Presbyterians in Great Britain and especially in Scotland. Many of us in America are very familiar with the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Westminster Catechisms. Well, when we think about the Continental Reformed, we're thinking about a group of um, documents that arose out of the continents of Europe, mainland Europe, and um, had its own distinct flavor of Reformed theology. So I don't know if that kind of helps to place us in terms of the Reformation and modern. Yeah, for things. sure. And so uh, Reformed <laughs> Church, I mean, people have, have heard that phrase, Reformed Church. They might have Googled Reformed Church. Mm -hmm. And what often comes up is... Christian Reformed Church, or the CRC, mm -hmm. um, and then you know here we are, the URC, the United Reformed Church. And so what is the difference, or, or how, how, how are those two connected, CRC, URC? Sure, yeah. So we do um, come from the CRC. We seceded from that, and what happened was the, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, many churches from the CRC began to secede from it, and for a time, they became independent while they were uh, organizing and beginning to think about a future affiliation with one another. But they, they seceded from the CRCNA because the CRC was moving in a progressive direction and abandoning many of the beliefs and practices that had characterized the Dutch Reformed from back in the time of the Reformation. And so things like abandoning a second service, a catechism service, which I think we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, changing the form of subscription that speaks about how church officers are bound to a confession of faith and a theological tradition. And things along those lines were, were occurring within the CRCNA. And this um, uh, resulted in many of the churches feeling conscience bound to, to secede in order to um, maintain their Reformed identity and their biblical convictions. So that happened in the um, that happened at, like I said throughout the late 80s, early 90s, and then that led to um, the first synod for the URCNA, United Reformed Churches, in the mid 1990s. Okay, and so West Side Reformed Church then um, <clears throat> has kind of you know, their their lineage. Um, um, through the CRC into the Dutch world and all ultimately into the kind of the continental reformation with Geneva and, yeah. and elsewhere. That, that's right. And we, when we think about our own congregation here, I think there are only a few of us that are actually uh, ethnically Dutch. But um, we, we certainly uh, celebrate that uh, ecclesiastical heritage. And you know, as we oftentimes speak, it, and you know this, Brandon, that on Sundays, we oftentimes make reference to the fact that the Reformed churches were not trying to do something brand new. We were not being revolutionaries. We were really reforming the church according to Scripture back to the ancient practices of the early churches. So being Dutch Reformed is really an attempt to be um, ancient and classical and, and lowercase c Catholic, in other words. Sure. So, yeah. um, so kind of honing in now on the identity of the URC, uh, many people understand or, or have been aware of like the Presbyterian mm -hmm. and how the Presbyterian churches structure themselves with Presbytery meetings right. and general assemblies and these kinds of things. And, you know, you mentioned a few things like synod mm -hmm. and other things. So 
what, what is the difference between maybe a Presbyterian form of government or even um, many of our listeners might be from, from a more Baptistic uh, background where they have a congregational polity? So how does the URC differ or um, situate itself? Yeah, good question. I think that um, we're, we, we do speak about ourselves as being uh, Presbyterian, but then we oftentimes qualify that to say, it's, but it's a lowercase p, Presbyterian. And so there's always a sense in which you can locate us somewhere in between um, an independent church model mm -hmm. and a capital P Presbyterian, like an American Presbyterian model. We, you, I used the word synod earlier. I'm glad you picked up, uh, asked me about that, picked back up on that. Synod is our word to refer to a denominational assembly where everyone comes together and in the Presbyterian world, you find that as a general assembly. Uh, ours is delegated, though, from the, the congregation. So each congregation sends two delegates to the synodical meeting. So we have that denominational assembly, and ours um, includes churches from Canada, some mission works in Mexico, and then uh, churches in the United States as well. We also have foreign missions and many of those missionaries come back to join our synod meeting as well. So there's an international flavor to it, which is pretty great. But then um, we also have regional assemblies similar to a presbytery meeting. We call it classes. And at those regional assembly meetings, we take care of things like uh, ordination exams. We think a lot about uh, missions and church planting on that regional level. But then when we then think about the local church, we call that uh, the body of elders in the local church, a consistory. And that includes ruling elders and teaching elders, also called ministers and elders. And so th that's the governing body of the local church. When we think about uh, the Dutch Reformed as it's manifest in the URC, we really are a more of a grassroots sort of um, denomination where the governing power is really uh, concentrated in the local church, in the local body of elders. We're not congregationalist. Uh, we we um, uh, emphasize the rule of the consistory. And so in that respect, we're, you know, we're not top-down driven. I think that there is a, a wariness that we have of being too top-down or uh, maybe being hierarchical because of some of the wounds that we experienced in the CRC where there was a perception that the, um, uh, the higher ups in the denomination were driving a lot of change, both theologically and liturgically. And so we're quite wary of that and want to keep the um, locus of authority in, inside the local church. So that could be something where perhaps people from a more Baptistic um, end of things who are elder led, elder governed, mm -hmm. Um, would find some level of um, appreciation there. But again, we're not independent of each other. We still have that, um, that view of our federation where we are responsive to our regional assembly, we're responsive to the federation, the synod, and we, we try to, um, uh, we, we operate harmoniously with one another. We do theology together, we do church discipline together. We're still very reliant upon that multitude of counselors that you find in the classes or in the synod. Right. Uh, you mentioned a few of them already, but as as a person is coming into the URC, um, they, be, they begin to hear this phrase, the three forms of unity. Um, what are these three <clears throat> forms of unity? Yeah, so the continental tradition has oftentimes embraced the uh, uh, th three documents that you refer to, the three forms of unity. And those are embraced in addition to uh, some of the ecumenical creeds, the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, and Athanasian creeds. But the three forms of unity then refer to the Heidelberg Catechism, the Belgic Confession, and then the Canons of Dort, the Rules of Dort. And so those would be the three forms of unity that we confess. And that would be, as I mentioned earlier, um, distinct, distinct from the uh, Presbyterian tradition that confesses a different confession of faith, the Westminster Confession, and their, their two catechisms. So we confess something um, that is theologically the same, but is manifest uh, differently with a different flavor, I'd say. Sure. 
And so if you want to be a pastor of a URC congregation, you have to, as you mentioned, subscribe mm -hmm. uh, to them. Do you have to... And it, in what way do you have to subscribe or agree to to uh, uh, teach within the boundary of, of them and agree with them? Mm -hmm. How does that work? Yeah, this is a little bit different, I think, from some of the American Presbyterians around us, where I think that there are different forms of subscription that you can find within, uh, for example, the uh, Presbyterian Church in America or the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, where they might allow for various kinds of exceptions being taken or scruples being taken with the doctrine. Um, that's in, in the standards, but for us at least, we have a, a view of subscriptions called strict subscription, and I personally find that to be a lot easier to do within the three forms of unity because they're not quite so precise and uh, not quite so detailed, and so we're able to subscribe to them strictly, which basically means that we don't take any exceptions to the doctrine that's taught in the uh, creeds or the three forms of unity, but the, uh, your pastor believes and promotes the entirety of what's in those documents without exception. And that's actually not even just for the ministers, but it's also for the elders and deacons, that they too subscribe to the same exact, um, uh, the same exact doctrine and the collection of documents that we confess. So you find a very robust, I think, um, embrace of our confessional heritage and creedal heritage and then a commitment to defending those and promoting those and to blessing the church with those with those doctrines okay so when a minister subscribes to the three forms are they saying um, I agree to the three forms the three documents insofar as they agree with with the Bible oh uh, it's not insofar as yeah that's a <laughs> Yeah, insofar it refers, could be said by pretty much anyone, couldn't it? So right, right. Um, I could subscribe to practically anything insofar as. But uh, mm -hmm. no, we, we subscribe to it uh, because uh, the documents agree with the Bible. Yeah. So because they faithfully teach the Bible. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, I think, distinction insofar mm -hmm. as versus because. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's helpful. So we, we talked about how uh, the ministers, the elders, the deacons, they are on board with the Belgian Confession, Heidelberg Catechism, Canons of Dort. Uh, how does that relate to the average congregant, the mm -hmm. average member? Are they subscribing in the, in the same way as a pastor does? Yeah, so subscribing is a technical term that refers to writing your name down. Mm -hmm. And so what you'll see happen, for example, within an ordination service is when someone's being ordained to an office, they'll often, you'll see them writing down their name upon the form of subscription. And that's you, you signing yourself up. Like you subscribe to a magazine. For those who are a little bit older, they might remember subscribing to a magazine. You sign yourself up to something. That's being done by an officer. Subscription is a technical term. But our members, however, do give their assent to their agreement to verbally to the teaching that's found within our creeds and confessions. So now that's a general rule where the consistory is allowed to make some exceptions mm -hmm. here and there as they see fit. But as a general rule, and we don't really have many of these kind of exceptions, at least in our church, where uh, people are accepting to things being taught. But um, yeah, as a general rule, our, our congregation, our members agree to the creeds and confessions as well. And so we end up then with a confessional church where we um, are able then very effectively to speak the truth to one another in love because we believe the same truths right. uh, because they come from Scripture. So, yeah, while our members don't subscribe, they do assent and affirm the teaching that's found in those documents as well. Okay, yeah, that's helpful. Um, so maybe for our listeners who might be thinking, uh, I'm kind of interested in the URC. Um, that sounds kind of a like an interesting thing. Could you tell me more about it? What is the URC like? Sure. Well, it'll differ a little bit from place to place. So in some congregations, as I mentioned, that uh, you might walk into, you might be part of a church where it is very ethnically Dutch. And so you'll see that in terms of, like I said, six foot six, blonde hair, blue eyed, and that's awesome. And then you'll have uh, little Dutch cookies and stroke waffles <laughs> and things like that. They're delicious. So there could be just that very simple experience as you walk into one of our churches and you'll hear Dutch accents. That's very neat and edifying. Um, so there can be that level of experience of what is it like. 
but I think probably more importantly, I think that what you would see within our churches is uh, the use of a common songbook. We're not required to, but we do use a common songbook. It's called the Trinity Psalter Hymnal. Some people are still using the older Psalter Hymnal. They've not yet transitioned to the new one, but there is a, a common expression of worship that you'll see that's found within a, a common songbook. And uh, within that, you'll find that we um, worship in a very similar way across our denomination. There's not this massive spectrum of worship, but we really have a, a unity, not uniformity, but unity in our worship, where you'll find us singing primarily psalms, but also uh, hymns. And uh, singing from a common songbook, you'll see, hear us confessing the Apostles' Creed. Uh, practically every single church, every single Sunday, they might confess, like ours does sometimes, the question and answer one of the Heidelberg Catechism or maybe the Nicene Creed, but we confess the same kind of stuff. You'll hear us reading the law each Sunday to be convicted of our sins. You'll hear us confessing our sins every Sunday. You'll have, um, you know, again, within our worship, you'll have two services each Lord's Day because we have one Lord's Day service where the pastor will be preaching through a book of the Bible. And then you'll have another service where you'll have the pastor teaching the doctrines of the Christian faith as summarized in the Heidelberg Catechism. The Catechism is divided into 52 sections according to 52 Lord's Days per year. And so that's the ordinary practice within our churches where a second, church, a second service will be one where the basics of Christianity are unpacked. So each year you're getting the full counsel of God. Each year you're hearing a sermon on the Trinity. You're hearing sermons on justification. You're hearing sermons on what the Ten Commandments require of us in a life of Christian gratitude. You're hearing the summary of the Gospel, the Apostles' Creed, being explained. So those basics of Christianity are coming to you year after year so we can drive deeper and deeper into those doctrinal basics so we have a christian worldview that can develop from those kinds of things uh, the basics of the lord's prayer are being taught year after year through the heidelberg catechism so i think there's a really beautiful um, balance between going through the bible um, by verse by verse chapter by chapter and then thinking about the entirety of the bible's teaching in terms of the uh, doctrinal statements that um, you find in it so that would be kind of a you know liturgical thing that you'd find within the URC in terms of that unity that we have with one another. I think you'd also see in the URC that we're um, really growing and um, uh, committing ourselves to the uh, significance of church planting, recommitting ourselves, maybe a, a better term there, that uh, we see that the gospel needs to go out and that um, we're talking and praying and trying to plant churches in places where there is no uh, Dutch ethnicity. We're trying to see the gospel go out and to bring our um, beautiful, rich heritage to bear in, in other places. And um, so, you know, we, we're see doing that here in Cincinnati. Um, we've helped get a church plant started in Indianapolis. We're no longer the ones overseeing that, but we've helped with that. We are overseeing a church plant in Madison, Indiana, and we hope to see other churches planted in the future as well, but really seeing the centrality and priority of the preaching of the gospel and administration of the sacraments in uh, Christian missions. Uh, also probably worth saying that I'm um, jumping back to worship, I forgot to mention this, but that uh, we also use what are called liturgical forms, and that becomes part of our worship service. So anytime you see the uh, sacraments administered or some other ecclesiastical rites like ordination occur, and oftentimes as well throughout the service, you might have liturgical prayers where there are congregational prayers being offered up. But we often use, or we um, uh, regularly use liturgical forms for those things. We have to use those for the administration of the sacraments. And uh, those are things that the minister will read. Those are things that the uh, synod has approved of. And the way you can think about it is this, that when a liturgical form is being read and used, that is not just the individual minister speaking and teaching, but rather the church corporate is teaching and speaking in that moment. 
and that the entire weight of the church's authority is being expressed to declare to us what the Lord's Supper means and how to partake of the Lord's Supper, what baptism means or what ordination is all about. And so it's a very beautiful uh, thing that connects us with the church Catholic as many of the forms and prayers are um, derived from our forefathers in the Reformed world, um, some from Martin Luther, uh, some of these things come from even earlier within the history of the church. So you might see uh, the use of what's called forms and prayers. It's a book that we use within our churches to um, uh, conduct the worship service. So if somebody is coming to the URC and they're, uh, they, they see the forms and prayers, they see, for example, that um, every church has to have a, a second catechism service, and they might ask, why does it have to be so? Um, mm -hmm. why, sure. why did the URC think it necessary to require a second catechism service on the Lord's Day? Yeah, I think to some it could come across as being legalistic or going way beyond Scripture. But the way that we think about the church is that as a federation, as a denomination, we are seeking not just the bare church, the existence of the church, but we are seeking to have vibrant, healthy churches. We are seeking to have churches that are uh, uh, distinctly, you know, Reformed Catholic, that we are knowing our identity, we're thriving and flourishing within our identity, not just some bare, mere Christianity, where everyone in the church believes something very different. There's this very bare confession of faith. No, we want to have a healthy church. And so what we've learned over the course of history is that to have this healthy church, this um, uh, environment where people are being really nourished and supporting one another in the Christian faith, that it's, it's wise to have things like a second service. It's important to do that because then we can have a catechism service and be instructed in doctrine. If you only have the bare things well, you pretty quickly give way to many of the progressive and liberalizing trends you find around us because there's not much to hold us, you know, together right. any longer. Right. And so I think a, a mere Christianity that's found in the church oftentimes because becomes no Christianity in very short order. So we, we, we seek a robust Christianity, a healthy Christianity, a very vibrant Christianity in our um in our quest. Yeah, that's helpful. And that's, that's really been my experience kind of coming into the URCNA from a different um, uh, background, just seeing how, um, how, how it is healthy. You have a membership that has been fed, I think, pretty well through uh, not only the first service, that's walking through books of the Bible, giving people um, the, the trees, you could say, mm -hmm. and then the second service, giving them the whole counsel of God, the forest kind of view, wow. and it's wow. been a helpful balance, I think. Well, thanks for tuning in to um, Cincy Reform Podcast. Uh, you can find us at cincyreformed.org. We are uh, sponsored by Westside Reform Church. You can look us up at westsidereformed.org. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks. <laughs>